Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Woo! Ah, buenos dias. All right, folks. I know people are still trickling in, but we have a phenomenal dialogue today, so I do not want to waste any more time. Uh, we want to welcome you to our session, La Lucha, The Struggle for One Day. Uh, my name is Patricia Leon Guerrero, and I have the privilege and honor of leading all of our Latino community efforts here at Teach for America. So I would like, without further ado, I'd love to take just a few moments to introduce our Emmy Award moderator today, Maria Hinojosa. Yes. <laughs> She's coming. I won't take up too much time. I know I stand between her and her phenomenal dialogue, so I will go, go briefly here. Uh, so for those of you who do not know Maria Hinojosa, Maria was born in Mexico City but is raised in Chicago, Illinois. She's the, yes, oh, you got some love here, every, every aspect. She is the executive producer for the Peabody award-winning show, Latino USA. I am humbled and honored. I had a moment to chat with her prior, a few weeks ago and just to hear her passion. The one thing that she said to me three minutes into the conversation, she said, thank you. And she said, thank you for your service for our communities. And so as she said that, I took that on behalf of all of our Latinos, uh, doing this work, leading in our community, teaching our students, and all of our teachers doing this critical hard work. And so I'm humbled and honored to welcome her to the stage as she'll open up the conversation with the phenomenal panelists that we have here today. So please join me in welcoming Maria Hinojosa. <laughs> Seriously, like I want to be here every Saturday morning. <laughs> Aplausos! Maria Hinojosa, wow! Wow, no, así no es en mi casa, you guys. Así no es en mi casa. No, no, no. It's like, mom, where were you? What? You mean you're not, you're traveling again? What? Um, <laughs> you know, they're just like, I, I, you're being Maria Hinojosa, not my mom. It's really cute. Okay, so um, I have a couple of um, thoughts I want to share with you, and then I want to start with our panel. But... Um, I'm telling you a few things that you know and some that you don't. I call what we're living in right now the U.S. Mambo. Um, it's a very confusing time, actually. I mean, we joke about it. You know, I actually used to say the U.S. Mambo, three steps forward, two steps back. <laughs> and it's like now it's three steps forward and about 67 steps back, right? And so you can't dance like that. No way. You can laugh first. That was a joke. <laughs> Loosen up, everybody. Um, but yeah, we can laugh, but it's also really sad, and I know that you know that too. So some of the U.S. mambo that I think about is the fact that, you know, Sofia Vergara is the highest paid television actress right now in the United States, but that we also have the highest rate of Latina adolescents attempting suicide, and that we have had for decades. Um, you know, the U.S. mambo. Latinos are the most powerful consumers right now, especially Latinas, 1.5 trillion, if not more. The fact, you know, we're, we're sought after for what we buy. We're also the fastest growing group of people behind bars, any kind of bars, whether they're detention or prison or jail. Um, we have an extraordinary political capacity at this moment, it literally rests on your shoulders, so not to put any pressure on you, but just to put the entire pressure of the world on your shoulders, um, it rests on your shoulders. And we know that you have the capacity, right, to go and engage and be involved, citizen or not. But the truth is, is that at this moment, we also know that there are hundreds, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people living in fear at this moment, today, and so I want to share with you a text that I received last night from someone who I know, who is undocumented Central American, came by plane with her daughter um, from uh, Central America, um, and, she's, and her daughter's in school. She's a uh, second year in high school. Señora, mire, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it in Spanish, then I'll translate. Mire, en la escuela de mi hija dijeron de que el gobierno quiere sacarlos de la escuela y deportarlos, que ahora la prioridad es deportar a los jóvenes. No sé si es por intimidar, es verdad, es verdad o es por, por meter miedo. Entonces, ¿es verdad? No estoy entendiendo. Um, 
This is somebody who just texted me last night saying, in my kid's school, they are saying that right now the priority is to deport all of the children, um, all of the young people. Is this intimidation? That's not Latino, that's not a Latino story, mis queridos and queridas. It's an American story. All of us are bearing the brunt of that fear. Because one way or another, whether or not people want to say it or not, these people who are part of us are part of us, with or without papers. And so their experience in this country impacts our experience in this country. That is a part of your responsibility as teachers to try to create, I don't know, maybe it's because you have this historic responsibility that you have to be a counterbalance to that, where there is fear and silence and invisibility, where you have to be visible, where your role is actually to see, to see others and to say, I see your story, I wanna hear your story, tell me what is happening to you. You value, you are valuable. You are not an other in this country. You are me and I am you. As teachers, I'm sorry, as teachers, that is what we can do. And I'm so lucky to be among you. First of all, I forgot to say my opening line, which was you guys are the coolest group of conference attendees that I have seen in like, I don't know how long, and I give a lot of speeches, and I hope I don't make any enemies like that. But seriously, you guys are amazing. Like the energy, the vibe, the diversity, it's like amazing. I wanna say it's hot, but it's hot, okay? Um, it's really, really, really fabulous. Um, but I know that you also understand the complexity of the Latino experience, right? And that your role is not to homogenize, but to look for the complexity. And that as teachers, you can instill that belief in that student to believe in their potential, right? To believe in their potential. For me as a professor, I tell my students who all feel invisible, and they're at DePaul University, the largest Catholic university in the country, you know, rated by Princeton as, you know, whatever, number one in the Midwest, et cetera, et cetera. And they're there, and they still feel invisible, and less than, and other. And I'm like, you guys are the winners. Believe it. Own your power. Own your leadership. That's the name of my class. Own your leadership, owning your personal narrative. Understand the power and then I put in parentheses, the political power that you have by owning your narrative. As teachers, you can encourage those young people in your classes and you in the process learn your own story. And perhaps as I have learned, when I open myself up as a teacher, it's when I get the most from my students. And I know that that's difficult and I know that you guys have amazing challenges, but letting your students see themselves in you is a way in which they learn to see themselves and all of their possibilities. Um, it is truly, truly, truly my honor to be here. As I said to several people already today, I know what I'm telling my son that he has to do the day after he graduates from DePaul University, and I want him to become part of Teach for America. So. You can tweet that out to him. Hey, Raul. Hey, Raul Ariel, Jesus de todos los santos, Perez Hinojosa. Your mother just called you out. Okay, and seriously, just I gotta give a shout out to my daughter because I'm so proud of her also because she also has a really cool name. Her name is Maria Jurema Guadalupe de los Indios Perez Hinojosa. She just got accepted early decision to Brown. Hello! I'm very honored, very, very honored. Um, I wanna bring up our panelists, Alejandra Ceja. She is the executive director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics. And Sarita Brown is the president of Excelencia en Educación, in Education. And um, they're joining me on stage, so come on up. Thank you so much for your work. I, I actually wanna start with you, Sarita. When this theme of, you know, uh, because we are still seen as the other, um, Latinos very specifically in this country, and we don't need any more proof that we're seen as the other than the political conversation that we're all witnessing, right? Whatever you think about it, where whoever you support, the truth is that there is a sense of Latino being the other. Um, how, how does that jive 
with the message here, which is the challenge confronting Latinos is not a Latino issue. It affects all of us. It is not just, and, and when we say Latino, we say all of us because by the numbers we understand that our future is increasingly Latino. I would go specifically with who we are and who we are, uh, Mexicanos, Cubanos, uh, uh, de Salvador, de Honduras. I mean, that's, okay, y sigue así. We'll be here all day, queridos, all day. <laughs> Que viva, no que viva. Bueno, pero, but, but that is the strength of the Latino community in the United States. So for me, I, I believe in the power of Latinos, and I think it's our responsibility to underscore for everyone what we've contributed to this country. Soy Tejana, so for me, the border moved on us. I'm, you know, we've been here always. This country is built with us. So in this moment of defining the challenge, I think it's essential that each of us knows who we are as individuals, who we are as part of the Latino community, and that we're always able to say immediately, here's what we've brought to our community, to our school, to our university, to our alumni, whatever it is. After we do that, then we talk about how the Latino community has always been part of the American society. And there are so many places that you could look to for that touch point, but I, because it's so red, white, and blue, look at the military. From the very beginning, we have fought for this country, we have died for this country, as no other community has. So when somebody wants to draw a line and say, we're, we don't belong, we're not here, we've always been here. This is our home, this is where we invest. And yet, and yet again, just take the military where we have been present for decades upon decades, that story is not fully told. And we have to press and press and press for that story to be told. In the case of the World War II veterans, half a million were Latino. Um, in, in World War II. Alejandra, so the narrative essentially, Sarita is saying, look, the narrative is that we have to take ownership of who we are, um, but that oftentimes the otherness part of it is the narrative out there, that we don't complete high school, that we're dropping out, that we are um, the other and that we are taking. Um, so flip, flip that narrative. What is in fact, give us the, and this is what we're bringing, and this is what we're bringing, and this is what you can bring into your classrooms as you teach. What are those things? Fact, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Ay, era para Alejandra. Did I say Sarita? No, Alejandra. Let me she did stop. say she's from the border in Texas. I'm just. <laughs> Maria, as, you, as I answer that question, just looking at this room, and how far TFA has come to embrace diversity and inclusion, to open the doors and create pathways for our DACA students to be in the teaching profession. That's the new narrative. I have the honor of representing an initiative and building on the foundation that other previous directors like Sarita had built on the White House initiative. And back in 1990, when we were created, we had the worst deficit-based narrative that existed. We were called dropouts. We were called in crisis. The best asset we have in this country is our Latino students. That's the future. That is the future of tomorrow. That is the promise of tomorrow. We have one of the highest graduation rates thanks to people like you in this room that are in those classrooms, in those communities helping our students achieve. We've got more students entering college at greater rates. But the problem here is that we still have to get those students not just to but through college. That's the narrative that we have to take ownership for. But I'm telling you, there is progress, and it's because of folks like you, the leaders in this room, that are making sure that we claim and we frame that new narrative. So one of the things that, um, that helped me in terms of flipping the narrative, which is actually a, a tool that I use as a journalist and as an American, right, is to just kind of constantly look at a situation and flip the narrative. Um, so there were reports that were coming out about how Latino children, um, I think in pre-K or in K, um, or in first grade, were not as um, literary ready. They hadn't read enough books at home and that there was some kind of like issue, and I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing here. But I think it was in that same report, or one that was released soon after, where what they noted also is that what Latino children actually bring into the classroom in terms of assets, 
um, social uh, capacity um, as young leaders, as setting the tone of respect, of being able to work collaboratively, of a kind of sense of humility. I, I don't have all of the scientific data. I'm giving you just kind of generalizations. But for me, it was like, wow, you know, usually you hear how these children are drained, but nobody is saying, y todo lo que traen, and everything that we bring. How, what is the role that you see in terms of TFA, in terms of pushing on that narrative, um, both as teachers themselves and in their own communities, and in having to, I'm sure in different moments of their life, having to confront this narrative and find themselves in the awkward position of having to challenge it themselves, Sarita. For me, the exposure to that kind of analysis about the assets of the Latino community, that we are very interpersonal, that Latino children are uh, very ready to interact, um, that we are also uh, children who get sent to school, portate bien, uh, and, and we do. Um, my Respeto a la maestra. Uh -huh. Uh, my, my first exposure to that was when I had the privilege of serving at the White House Initiative, and early childhood development was a new thing for me. But what we found as we looked at that characteristic is how it gets interpreted by teachers uh, is critical. Um, so, really basic things that all of you know. I mean, too often, this was in 1997 to 2000, still too often, PTA efforts uh, in schools um, were really oblivious to the reality of most of the working class parents where our children were growing up in. And so they didn't participate. And all of that got interpreted as Latinos didn't care about education. But when you went into school districts that understood that had nothing to do with it, it had all to do with practical issues like when the bus schedule was and when they could get away and what they could do, that that changed it. The same thing is true about this characteristic of Latino children. I mean, it is, we get passed around a lot as little kids, right? You know, tío, tía, I mean, whoever. You, we, and, and that does create a real openness. That openness in your hands as teachers and then your recognition that regardless of whether or not a parent knows that calculus is essential to be an engineer or whatever it is that's on the you know, flight path to go to college, but that that parent wants that child to have the best this country has to offer, that's where you as teachers and then in all the other ways that you involve redefine who the Latino community is. So Alejandra, thank you for that, Sarita. Alejandra, I want to actually ask you to be, and, and we know that you represent this amazing title, working at the White House um, on this amazing project no, to, to excellence for Latino students. But I'm going to flip the narrative on you for a second. I'm going to ask you about your own personal experience. Um, so somewhere along the line, something happened where you believed the power of your own narrative, the power of your own story. Did that happen in a classroom for you? And, and how have you understood that in the sense of the fearlessness in your life to get you where you are today? Absolutely. For me, it came down to the issue of access, equity, and opportunity. I grew up in Huntington Park, California. It's a southeast, southeast community in Los Angeles. Um, I went to a school that by definition is a, a low performing school. There was not a lot of incentives for us to achieve. And, knowing that my parents came to this country. My dad had been deported three times as a migrant farm worker, but he was in la lucha, in that struggle to make sure that his kids could do better. I knew I had a responsibility to ensure that my education could open up those doors that my parents were denied in their country. So in my community, instead of talking about educational excellence, we were talking about building a prison right down the street. And so that sparked for me the interest in wanting to understand policy, wanting to understand who is at the table making decisions and talking about my community. And I grew up in California at a time when we had a governor that was proposing anti-immigrant, anti-bilingual propositions. And he was talking about me and my siblings and my friends and my community. And he didn't understand the assets that we bring, not just then, but today. And so to be a Mexicana in this position representing a White House initiative representing the future of what's to come for those other students on those doors that I can open. For me, it was about 
how do we keep the focus on equity? How do we keep the narrative on what we know we bring to this table? And to honor the legacy that my parents, that opportunity they were giving me. Because even today, I mean, we, I go across the country and I talk to students. We have to encourage them and inspire them to achieve. We have to break down those barriers. I've been trying to knock on doors and sometimes they just don't get when I talk about what this community brings to the table. But when I make that business case, when you talk about the buying power, when you talk about in 2050, we're gonna represent one in three workers, we're gonna represent 60% of the population growth, then it starts resonating. But I feel like I have an obligation to continue representing for all those other immigrant students, for all those parents that are in La Lucha, that it can be done, that you can break down these barriers if you have access to quality education, if you ha have access to great teachers, and if people help build your dreams, if they can work with you to make sure that you can graduate and enter the workforce and be all that you can be and reach your full potential. A lot of that, um, for a lot of the students, uh, actually, let me ask you this question. I'm gonna turn it back on you. Why? Because I can. Okay, so, a ver, sin pena, you know, without any shame. How many of you kind of feel invisible from the media narrative out there? Overwhelmingly, just like invisible. Oh, okay. Okay, are you thinking about it? Okay. Interesting, so that's like about half of you. So, um, let's talk a little bit, Sarita, about what that looks like. So that's a great, that's actually great. I thought more hands were gonna go up. Um, so that's a positive, um, a positive expression. What do you want those who see themselves as visible, therefore owning their narrative, what do you want them to do in the classroom? And what, and, and how can you kind of pair with what you want them to do with actually things that you have seen done that make you get so excited that it's just like your brain is on fire because you get to see all of these amazing projects that are. So give us an example of one of those amazing, amazing projects and what it is that you want that visibility to look like in the classroom. Well, Maria is referring to the fact that um, we do on an annual basis um, bet on you. We bet on the capacity of those who care about Latino students and the future through something called Examples of Excelencia. And every year we put out a call for nominations for programs and departments at colleges, universities, and community-based organizations that show with evidence, with data, that they are effective. And we were honored to have Maria come and speak. In fact, she spoke the year that the government was closed. And even while the government closed, we went on because this never stops. What I do want for everyone who cares about this issue is to be prepared. Now, you're prepared for your teaching every day in your classroom, and that is core. But you're also leaders outside the classroom. And that's really, I think, where I want to make common cause with all of you because you are people of enormous credibility and great influence. You are people who are not only talking, but you're walking it. And your capacity to tell other people when they talk about the Latino community and education as an entrenchable situation, it will never change. You can say your own experience and how you've changed it, but what I would want is for you to know that there is an inventory of programs across this country that have turned it out, that can be replicated. And what I would want is, whether it be in media, whether it be in civic affairs, that this discussion about our numbers be a discussion about the wealth of human capital. I've been doing this a really long time, for 30 years, I've been hearing the product, you know, what's gonna happen with the demography. It's, <laughs> there's nothing predetermined. There's a lot of us. That's what we can say. There's a lot of us. It's this watch, it's right now, that that promise of the lot of us, the quantity of us, and the intentionality to say, we are gonna build on strength, when we see something that works, we're gonna invest in it. And I mean that in every which way. You invest in it with your time, your energy, your money, and then you call the question. 
Alejandra has spent time with her team developing something called bright spots. Those bright spots are wonderful, but too often those bright spots are there because a few people care and they're keeping it strong. And when those few people leave, what's going to happen? It is time that we know what works, that we invest in those solutions. And when somebody doesn't know what to do, you can say, fine, if you don't know, let me give you 10 things across America that work. So and basically, it, what, it seems what you're saying is that um, you see oftentimes that, at least specifically in terms of the Latino community, perhaps we don't understand the role that we have in taking ownership of our own leadership. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we question, even if we're like, no, I, I believe that this is a way to go it, do this or solve this problem, that sometimes we basically psych ourselves out. Psych ourselves out. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I have un, been experiencing the heartbreak of perhaps people who feel invisible or like your students are not convinced that they belong. And when somebody tells them they don't do it right, whatever it might be, that they're not, you know, like the parent who doesn't show up at three in the afternoon at the PTA meeting and it's your fault, your child's not going to school, when that parent is saying, I'm doing the very best I can, which is making sure my child goes to school and that everything is paid for and we go forward, we have to grab a hold of that. And I don't want to say be so arrogant as to reject any kind of criticism, but to always assert we show up, we work hard, we're there, we're invested, and that where there are solutions, there are community-based organizations, PK, the Parent Institute for Quality Education, I mean, there's an abundance of them. And when we talk to people who say, you know, Lat the Latino dropout rate is what it is, it's not going to change, we have to be prepared to say, unacceptable. If it's not changing in your community, then you're not using effective strategies. Punto final. I can't remember, um, I, I don't know the most recent statistics, but there, I, it was three years ago when I ended up in Syracuse, New York, and, and it, 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 I was told that the Latino dropout rate of the city of Syracuse was 65%. And it's just like, so that means that when it was at 50%, everybody was like, eh. And then when it was at 55, they were like, eh. And when it was at 60%, they were like, eh. Oh, say, ah, what? Now, I do think that what Sarita is saying, and I think we put it back on you, on everyone who's, who's here, actually, Latino and not, which is the importance of that role that you have as leaders in your, in your community, in your classroom. Um, my students, what I tell them, because a lot of them talk about the invisibility, is that you know, they need to see themselves if they're um, children of immigrants, and many of them are first generation, I'll tell them, you know, your, your families are, are the new pilgrims, right? You all read about the pilgrims. You are them. And history books will be written about your arrival during this time. And you will be written about as the pioneers, right? Um, that is a history that we are all creating. And as teachers, you have the capacity to play an incredible role there. My students, for example, um, you know, one of them, um, her dad was shot a month after she graduated, just in June. Um, and she's there in school. She's there in school. They worry about money. Many of them come to me and say, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to make it next quarter. I'm really scared. Um, some of them, my Latinas, are just like, you know what, I love school so much, I don't want to have kids, but my family thinks I'm totally weird. Um, these same young women have to go after being at the library and studying, then they have to go home and do a second a second turno, right? Cleaning the dishes, feeding her brother, their brothers and sisters, um, and their parents maybe don't even believe how much homework they have. And sometimes the students, as one of my students said to me just this past Thursday, um, I said, what, what can I do for you? And she said, maybe you can just listen. And that's what I did, and I do that a lot in my life. That's my job, in fact. But for a student, sometimes I feel like sometimes we all feel like we've got to have the right answer. We've got to have the answer. We've got to have the, well, you've got to go talk to this person or this person or fill out this you know, answer and you're going to. And sometimes as our role as leaders and in the classroom, it is about being able to listen. Um, Alejandra, before we open it up to questions, um, what is it? You, you, 
lay out the challenges that for you, you also see as opportunities, that the young people in this room can also begin to see the same, where there might be an, a challenge, maybe it's a challenge to your own capacity to believe that you can lead in the, in the conversation, in the solution to the problem, that then becomes an opportunity. We all have a role to play in the future and success of this country. And education is probably the best economic policy driver that we have. So investing in education is, is definitely critical. But if you, if you step back and just take a moment to the discussion that we're having of where we're at in this country today, you can walk into any public school across the country and you will see the diversity in our public schools. We have a new majority minority September of 2014 marked the first time that you have more Latinos, more African American, more Asian Americans, more Native Americans in our classrooms. So diversity matters. So we all have a role, we all have a voice, and we're, we're up here talking about the importance of our narrative, and it takes all of us to talk about the successes of the, the parents that come, that are committed, those students that are persisting. It's about bringing to light that narrative that you're seeing in your community. And I've had the opportunity to travel um, across the country and in the South in particular, you're seeing, you're seeing our Latinos start businesses. Latinas in this country, one in 10 of, of uh, US uh, owned women's firms are run by Latinas. There is a positive narrative and it takes all of us to make sure that we amplify and that we highlight what is working. And what is working? We've got some great federal investments, the promised neighborhoods that make sure that it's about the community coming to the table so that we support our teachers, we support our principals, we support our parents. I've been in, in the South where they invite me to a parent engagement conference that's gonna start at 8 p.m. because that's when parents are coming from getting off of their two to three jobs that they're holding down. It's about having culturally competent strategies that work with our community, and it's about elevating our voice to make sure that we keep a focus on equity, especially given that we've got this new Every Student Succeeds Act, that is the civil rights issue of our generation is gonna be education, and we have to make sure that we don't turn the clock back on accountability, that we set high standards for all students, and that you have the support and resources you need. So we did a big call last year for commitments to action. And I started with uh, just a vision of what that could look like, Maria. And we ended up challenging a national call to action from this president, challenging our country, our businesses, our private sector. And we ended up having a celebration where we announced over $335 million in commitments to action from the business sector, from teachers, from parents. The smallest contribution was from a woman in New Jersey who gave us $300, but she said, I want to create an early learning program. And without making apologies that we're investing in our Latino students, that we're investing in our communities. So I think as we um, move to questions, you know, one of the takeaways I think that both Alejandra and Sarita want to leave you with, and certainly myself, is, um, is to believe in yourself, right? Um, when I... Um, when I had to make a decision about launching my own company, which is a nonprofit, you know, seriously, guys, I was a journalist. I had never run a company, pero ni modo, pues ahí me tiré, and I'm just like, here I am, and I'm gonna do this. And we, that ownership of your narrative is about, um, you know, my former assistant, Nancy, Nancy Trujillo, who's, um, who's named after Nancy Reagan because her parents got their path to citizenship through Ronald Reagan, and she was the firstborn. And Nancy would always say whenever she would feel um, overwhelmed by whatever when she was studying at Barnard that she would think about her mom, cruzando la frontera, right, at 17 or 18 years old, and she would find her strength there. Sometimes we don't believe in the strength that we have, and I think our message to you is own that power and own your personal narrative. Um, and, and then what happens is that you're able to take a little bit of control. So for example, in my newsroom, the one that I created, we don't use the term minority. It's not part of our, it's not in our reporter's words. We don't talk about minorities because I don't see myself as a member of a minority group. And I, thank you. You're like, <laughs> I think she's right. Um, I'm not, I'm trying to. It's just that you guys, with, with, the, with what's gonna become a minority in the future, do we really wanna keep on using those terms? 
right? Minority in so many ways means disempowered, right? Invisible, disenfranchised. And we don't want that for any community that's going to be a part of the future of the United States. And we also don't use this term. We don't use the word illegal to refer to immigrants mm -mm. because... Because it's grammatically incorrect and there is no such thing as an illegal human being, to quote Elie Wiesel, who survived the, whole, uh, the Holocaust, um, and he's the one who taught me that. Um, if we take questions, how do we take them? There's a microphone? There's a microphone someplace. There it is. Okay. Okay, great. Um, we'll start with you. Um, just be really quick about it. <laughs> or else I'll cut you off. Hello, my name is Jesus Eduardo. Speak up, speak up. Oh, okay. My name is Jesus Eduardo Fuentes. First of all, I want to thank you all for coming. It's great to see three strong Latinas up there, just like my mother. So, no, but I'm serious. When you were talking about how you behave in school because deberías de portarte, respeto a la maestra, I was like, yo, she was in my head. Um, two quick questions. One, what do you all see as the next step for the White House initiative? I know that there's been commitments from organizations across, like the business sector, private sector, you know, people just trying to help out. But is the next step seeing that commitment through? Like, how are we evaluating that? And then more, another question I have in my mind is like, what, what can we do or like what's being done about the STEM? Like, I've read some of it on the website as well, but like, you know, there's only 16, just like the website says, there's only 16% of Latinos completing their STEM education for the bachelors and there's less than 10% for our Latinas. So like, and that hits home for me because I know that I was one of those kids that had, didn't have access to all those STEM courses just like millions of others, you know. I think the stat on the site was like less than 67%, you know, have access to like calc, biology, you know, the basics of science and science literacy. So like, what are our next steps for that? Okay, thank you. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another question from the other side and maybe get another question and then the panelists can respond. So go ahead with your question on this side, yes. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Uh, first of all, Maria, you're like super strong when you were just flexing. Look at that. She must do CrossFit. Look at that. That is impressive. And you're I, from you know why? You know why I work out? Por qué? <laughs> One, because you never know when I'm going to have to you know, take on somebody. No, no, no. But actually, actually, it's sobre la mente, right? It is the mental health thing that allows me to disconnect to feel and also to, um, to prove like, yeah, I'm a midget, but I can be strong too. <laughs> que vivan las chaparras. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> que vivan las mujeres latinas y de todo, lo, el, todo el mundo. <laughs> eh, bueno, tengo que cambiar de, de idioma. So, here we go. I actually have two challenges for the people in this room. One is going back to the term minority. Um, I work at Teach for All, and we're trying to push the term global majority. So. Quick exercise, anytime you see somebody, you're reading New York Times, Thomas Friedman, whatever, and you see the term people of color or minority, cross it off and write global majority. And you're gonna like see what a difference that makes. So that's my challenge to everyone, all of us. Our charge is start using the term global majority. And is, then- Are you saying global majority or global majority? Majority. 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 My okay. accent kicks in, I'm sorry. Okay. It's like- sorry. So we're clear, all right. And then I wanted to, you, you recently just did a piece on Puerto Rico. Yes. I'm not bor Boricua, yes. but my second charge is, I think we should start to teach for Puerto Rico. What do you guys think? Yeah. Yeah. So if maybe the three of you can like present evidence in a case for starting a teach for I, Puerto I, Rico. I think you need to come and talk to Alejandra because she just looked at me and went like, yeah. So like, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, and I was a witness. Do you have a question? So you should come and talk to her. Do you have a question, my love? Yeah, I want to sign up for your class. How do I do that? <laughs> you Sign up at DePaul University. Okay, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> we start at 8 o'clock in the morning on Thursday. Thank you, sweetie. Una pregunta, yes. Good morning. My name is Sara del Castillo, and muchísimas gracias por sus palabras y uh, su consejo, because this is a huge issue. And a part of the narrative I wanted to talk about and ask a question about is this narrative of unaccompanied minors that are now coming into the United States who don't, can't apply for DACA um, and, and came in too late and didn't meet the requirements. Um, I'm an ESL or ELL teacher, and yeah, holla to my ELL people. Um, what is happening in <clears throat> DC on, on a political level to, to address the issues of this growing population and to give resources to our children who aren't even 
able to learn the language because our schools aren't supporting them and our politicians are not supporting them? Um, what is being done in Washington, D.C., and how can we better support this growing population of Latinos who are escaping so many terrible um, issues in their own countries? Um, so that's my big shout out to the ELL community and, um, and these Thank children. you. Thank you, sweetie. Um, it, it, you know, again, part, the U.S. Mambo is like that, right, that we can have um, people here who have worked in the White House, Latinas power, who are working, right? Very powerful and at the same time that we understand that there are children in our midst who are Latinos and who are um, ashamed of who they are, invisible. So let's tackle some of those issues before we jump into some more questions. Alejandra, do you wanna jump in? Absolutely. Um, should I start off with the... Yeah, you, you can combine your answers too. So, um, the gentleman who asked about commitments and next steps and accountability, this year where a lot of our commitments are rolling out. Um, and I tell folks, because we had, a we had a call to action last year doesn't mean we should stop. It doesn't mean just because we were galvanizing over a 25 year anniversary we should stop. I'm still looking to generate commitments. A lot of our bright spots that we highlighted um, have told us how just having the national spotlight from the White House initiative has given them access to additional resources. So in terms of accountability, we're bringing to light and bringing attention to the, first of all, the people that came to the table because it was a struggle. Um, people did not want to make commitments. And the fact that we can celebrate that we got 335 million, it's a huge accomplishment, but we need to continue to we need to continue to engage everyone to invest in our global majority of students. And it starts by making those commitments and it starts by highlighting those bright spots. In regards to STEM, one of the best tools I can point you to is the civil rights data collection. We can talk about the importance of STEM, but when you go into a community and you realize they're not offering the full range of STEM courses, we are not serving our students we're not serving our parents and we're not doing the narrative justice. The civil rights data collection will give you a sense you can populate, you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you what's happening in the school district of your child. It'll tell you what's hap what, what are the deficits. And to your, the last question, we, we are trying to provide as much leadership and support to our growing English language learners. There's a new guide that the department put out. Dr. Libya Gill runs our Office of English Language Acquisition. There's a new guide that talks about resources. There's a new guide that talks about how we can ensure that we have culturally competent, not just bilingual, multilingual teachers in the classroom. Um, and we are working in the community trying to address what's taking place in terms of the fears from parents and students regarding immigration. But until we, as a community, ensure that we push for and advocate for comprehensive immigration reform, we're gonna to continue to have these challenges. Unfortunately. Um, Maria, okay, Maria, yes. And I do think that we have to own the agenda. So while I do think that the role for federal government, state government, local municipalities is always there, it is um, a mistake at any moment to let up that the kind of leadership that Teach for America breeds is exactly the kind of leadership that is required to move this forward. I came out of the White House initiative very proud of what I learned about 24 federal agencies. But presidents change, secretaries change, budgets change, and our community mm -hmm. doesn't. Yeah. And so we own this agenda. We make it happen. And what we chose to do was to create a new nonprofit organization that will be there regardless of who's in the White House, regardless of who's governor. And that kind of opportunity is created by inside, outside, the long haul. We have got to own this agenda and assert our ability to make it happen. All right, so let me ask you this. How many of you, without you know, thinking twice, see yourselves as leaders already. Raise your hand if you do. Oh, we love you guys. Okay, well, I guess my job is done. <laughs> <laughs> I think they got it. That's like so cool. Now, I have a problem because I have to lead you to a very difficult moment, which is that I have literally four minutes left and about 10 questions. So I don't know what to do. My feeling is that if you can do bullet point questions really fast, at least 
then they get a chance to hear and your fellow attendees can see what's on your mind. But it means you kind of got to ask your question and move on and we'll just get all these questions as we possibly can. Go ahead. All right. Um, so I'm a social studies teacher in Houston. My name is Alex. And right now, it's really hard to motivate my students because our textbooks for U.S. history, it is a white narrative. Our American history is also Latino history, and right now I do not see that. So I want to see legislation, I want to see people fighting for us to be included, because my students right now are not achieving because of that. And wh who's fighting for us? I mean, Arizona, you know, bringing down Latino history, how could that even happen? How is that a reality right now? Okay, so, so first of all, listen to Latino USA, where we do the real history of, we do that story where we actually do the real histories. And I think the other thing is that you need to own this issue. I want to see you leading the conversation about let's change the history books. And then also, if all of you can go see, I know it's almost impossible, but if you can somehow see Hamilton, right? Where, just so you understand what Lee Manuel Miranda has done, right, is that the founding fathers are all men of color on stage, rapping. So talk about taking history and flipping it out in its head. Thank you so much. Your question over here. Hi, I'm, I'm Kevin Pelais from San Diego, and uh, my... <laughs> My question was not just how can we incorporate more curriculum, but how can we bring more teachers of color when our, at least in my school, the teachers don't represent the population that we serve. Okay, how do we bring more yeah. teachers of color? Thank you. Your question? Um, my question was, you mentioned where there's like solutions, there are parent-based organizations and such, but what do we do when the issue is beyond that? And there's an intersectionality of different issues such as not being able to find the resources for drug rehabilitation plus undocumented status right, right. when they're a high school dropout but they can't apply for a GED program because they do not have identification. Are there any programs in place that are tackling these specific issues that affect their children in the future? Uh, great question. Uh, great question on the intersectionality. Over here in the green. Hi, good morning. My name is Elsa. I'm Dominican. I'm from Miami. Shout out to everybody. Um, my question slash comment is this. Um, I often feel that as a Latina, I am only valued if I am educated. And I think that as I find dreamers and that guy inspiring, but I think of the Latino students who for whatever reason didn't have that opportunity, maybe can't do their GD. What is the dialogue behind still valuing them as humans without a bachelor's degree? Mmm, we love this group. Okay, yes. Your question, quickly. My name is Maxi Gluckman, and I work with a nonprofit Students Helping Honduras to improve education opportunities in Central America. And my question is, how can we work in collaboration with programs that are working here in the United States and those that are working internationally to ensure that when we raise the level of education for Latinos here, that those that are in Central America are also receiving the same opportunities? Okay. Um, well... You guys are, thank you so much. These questions are like fabulous. I think I'm gonna have to give my panelists one minute each to kind of wrap up and tr attempt to answer your questions and leave you completely inspired and uplifted at all at the same time. So, <laughs> and in less than 60 seconds each. And I think we'll start with you, Alejandra. Um, the gentleman that asked about the teaching profession, we have to drive those numbers for the global majority. We've got a new uh, secretary, John King, who this is one of his main priorities. We're trying to invest in the better preparation and having culturally competent teachers that have the resources, that have the support that they need. You'll see um, next week we're rolling out some exciting budget proposals and it'll the, the teaching agenda will be at the forefront. We're working with organizations like um, teach.org uh, to make sure that we can increase the diversity in our teaching profession. So it's a huge priority of ours. Um, programs I've seen that really kind of wrap, provide those wraparound services, we've seen, um, we've been out in Los Angeles and we've seen how the Promise Neighborhoods, um, investments in Promise Neighborhoods are working. Um, we've seen how student support services ensuring that we have access not just at the K through 12 level but in higher ed are working. So continuing to make sure that we make dynamic investments in education is going to be the best economic policy we can, we can put forward. And just in my whatever 60 seconds I have left. Um, just Negative mi 10 seconds. Mil gracias. <laughs> Just thank you. I, I don't think we take enough time to say thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you for the issues that you're championing. Yes. So I can't do this work. I can't fulfill the mission of this executive order for this White House initiative without your leadership. So it's an honor to be here amongst you all. And I'll, I'll be around for questions afterwards. Okay, Sarita. Use this conference as a touchstone. 
You not only have the opportunity to network with each other because you are a generation of leaders, but the kinds of speakers that you are coming into contact with, all of us have fairly significant networks of our own. Organizations that we can put you in touch with, programs that we can introduce you to, but don't take no for an answer. I mean, I can go specific on, uh, there are institutions that are graduating more Latino teachers than others. Uh, you teach from the University of Texas at Austin. There's an abundance of things. Growing What Works database is available to us. You can peruse 150 programs. You'll see the names of the individuals, the air email addresses, their phone numbers, reach out to them. But in a global way, don't take no for an answer. Don't take no for an answer. Again, we always talk about the demographics. We talk about it as if it's a predetermined situation. We're living through the fact that there are a lot of us. Whether or not that number becomes the lifeblood of this country is up to what we do together and count on each other because it will have to happen on this watch or it will not happen and will allow people to demagogue and talk about the Latino community in inaccurate, incorrect ways. It is now that we must bind together and make this happen. Thank you. All right, so we are, thank you to my panelists. We're now gonna hear from your fellow Teach for America uh, alums who are gonna come up and speak briefly and then we'll open it up to questions with them. So thank you so much to my panelists Mr. and we'll see you in a second. Yeah. Mr. Malik, I have one question that this panel can ask. Um, Mike, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm not going to take no for an answer. Uh-oh. Um, what can we do, and what is the White House doing to prepare and protect our students if DACA is overturned? Okay. Thank you. And you got to answer that. <laughs> Um, one of the things we're doing is really trying to identify strategies, trying to identify the partners that are with us that are helping provide resources to our DACA community. So happy to have this discussion with you. Um, it, I think, as Sarita mentioned, it's going to take all of us to make sure that it's not overturned, to make sure that we can bring attention to the contributions that our DACA recipients are making. And again, I mean, I think it takes the courage from organizations like TFA to open up pathways to our DACA recipients. We gotta push more of those uh, organizations to do similar things. So it's a long-term strategy, but there are some short-term solutions that we can work towards. And this is a moment in history. I really do appreciate yeah. your question. It is a moment in history, and all of us are living through it. All of us have a role to play. Absolutely. Let's bring up our alum to hear from them, Thank and you. then more questions. So that's going to be really hard to follow, um, but we're going to be brief. So basically they've called us up here as alum to show the diversity of what alums are doing to really push this narrative of what, we are, what are we doing for the Latino community that is not just a Latino problem but an American problem. And so my name is Pablo Villavicencio. I am the Director of Principal Leadership and Support for San Francisco Unified School District. Thank you, San Francisco, yes. And La so originally I'm from Los Angeles. My parents are... Actually my parents are Ecuadorian immigrants. I grew up in El Sereno, East LA, so I also feel partly Mexican. And so the reality came that I had the privilege, prior to this role, I had the privilege of serving um, immigrant youth that were overage and undercredited and had one of the lowest graduation rates of the Bronx. And I um, helped build a school with the community of educators that really tried to create a safe space that addressed the whole child. And the reality is, is that a lot of our Latino youth come and they don't find places that really nurture and accept them for who they are. And they become disenfranchised really quickly in the education process, especially if you're coming and you're a SIFE student that doesn't even read in your own native language. You come to a place, it's a new structure, it's a different experience of a school, different expectations. And then people give up on them. And so we wanted to create a space where that was unacceptable. And the truth is that there are technical leadership challenges about where do we find enough qualified, truly bilingual and biliterate teachers? What do we do in order to ensure 
that students who cannot read in their native language can learn their native language and learn English and see that as an asset, not as a deficit that they speak Spanish. And so we are educators that have had many, we're privileged. I'm privileged, even though I come from a low income background because I have education. And with privilege comes a certain responsibility and often we want to like move up the ladder. I was gonna be a lawyer, I was going to law school, you know, the TFA narrative. And so, <laughs> and so my, my call to action is that the, the day in and day out work of being an educator, of being in the classroom, of being a principal, of being a district leader that serves Latino youth, that's hard, especially when they want to get them on that a lot, you know what, every single day and you're trying to get them to read and all this stuff, and, that, and it wears. And so I'm, I'm, my plea is for you to show up because they need educators that they can relate to, that understands their experience, and that ultimately is going to tell them that they are loved, that they're wonderfully and woefully made, and that they have a purpose in our larger community. And so um, as much as you can, Stay in the classroom, stick with districts, be there where our students are actually showing up. Thank you. <clears throat> Buenas tardes, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Isela Pelayo. I am currently the State Director for Bilingual Multicultural Education and Title III Program, serving English learners in New Mexico. From LA, Boodle Paramount, next to Continent <laughs> Love Beach. <laughs> Um, I want to both, uh, well actually th three things, invite, challenge, and demand. So I think I want to invite you to be thinking about having a can-do, si se puede attitude so that one day we can say si se pudo. Um, I think we, we need to have a strong sense of possibility. Um, like Pablo said here, we need to move away from that deficit perspective and really have that can-do attitude. So because our thoughts become our words and our words become actions, we have to start there. So start thinking about having that can-do mindset for everything that we need to happen, need to, need to have happen. The second thing would be to um, be more intentional and strategic about the way we frame and talk about things because we know that context matters. Um, we know that Maria said we need to own our narrative and Sarita doubled down on that as well. I think we need to uh, provide that counter narrative. We need to own the story and, and say what we need to say. Uh, we know that our experiences inform our thinking and we need to honor that. But we also need to be really thoughtful about how we talk about these issues um, with, with those that could be potential partners in the work. Uh, so that means creating um, open spaces for courageous conversations and not be willing to back down from those, but also be, be th mindful about how we have those conversations so that we can be heard. Um, the third thing I think is, is really important is that we lift each other up. Um, we, we have a room full of amazing leaders. It's humbling to be here because all of you are just way awesomer. And I think it's really important for us to be supports for each other and to remember that somebody gave us a chance and we're now in the position to do that for others and we need to do it and not just talk about it. And that means opening up your networking um, to others, start inviting others into the fold. Um, I think that's really important that we invest in ourselves because as we said, it's our agenda and we can't wait for someone else to give us a hand out. We really are in a place now where we can invest in ourselves and we need to create that opportunity to build capacity within ourselves and be passing the baton and paying it forward. So with that, I just wanted to say thanks so much and remember that it's, it's what we think, what we say, and what we do. Um, so that's both an, an invitation, a challenge, and actually a demand. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Veronica Palmer, and I was a 2006 Los Angeles Corps member. And now I'm back home in my hometown of Denver, Colorado, where I'm a seventh generation native. Yes. So I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of Rise Colorado. And I want us to think about, in our work of closing the opportunity gap and achieving educational equity, family and community engagement can no longer be a nice, ha a nice to have. It must become a must have. Looking at our country's most successful social justice movements, they have always been led by those most impacted by the inequity that exists. Women led the suffrage movement, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta led the farm workers movement, 
and Martin Luther King Jr. and African Americans led the civil rights movement. So I ask, who's most impacted by the opportunity gap? It's low-income families and families of color, or as our friends shared, the global majority. Therefore, they must be the ones to lead this movement if we're ever going to truly achieve educational equity. Our Latino community will be the majority or global majority population soon. So I ask, what are you doing in your day-to-day -day work to uplift and elevate the voices of our families and truly put them at the forefront of the movement for educational equity? And what are we doing to provide our families with the skills, tools, and knowledge they need to become their child's number one teacher and advocate? Please help families realize their power. Our families are powerful, and they want to change the system. Let's help them realize their power and ability to transform our public school system for their children. Families truly are the sleeping giant, especially our Latino families. Once our families are awakened to the inequity that exists, there's nothing they won't do to ensure that their children overcome the opportunity gap and receive the excellent education that they deserve. And families are ready. We're seeing this in Los Angeles, in Colorado, and across the country. Families are ready to lead this movement for themselves. So let's be their allies and stand alongside our families and truly put them at the forefront of this movement and make sure that they change our education system for forever because our families deserve no less. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas Padilla. I am a 2009 RGB Corps member, or <laughs> And um, I'm the president of the Cisnero Center for New Americans. And 18 years ago, I stepped into a classroom for my first day of school in the United States. And I, this is a day that will be burned into my mind for the rest of my life. I remember walking in, feeling AC in a classroom, and seeing the carpeted floor, a room full of faces, a lot, a lot of people that didn't look like me. And my teacher walked me to the front of the room and asked me to sit down. And before my butt could hit the chair, this booming voice came on from the ceiling. All of the, everyone around me <laughs> got up, put their hand on their chest, and started talking to the front of the room. So <laughs> as any reasonable preteen would do, I did exactly what everyone around me was doing. And I got up, put my hand on my chest, and started to the, talking to the front of the room. <laughs> and it wasn't until that after school that day, that evening, that I talked to my uncle who lived here that I realized that was the Pledge of Allegiance. And that was something that was going to start my day every day for the next six years in America, in the American schools. And that experience, the knowledge that I was an English learner, that I was a Latino, that I was a part of an immigrant family, was something that I carried through every day of my schooling and I carried with me to this day. And that's why I do or why I'm a part of the Cisnero Center. At the Cisnero Center, we work to ensure that every American, whether native born or adopted by our nation, has the opportunity to achieve their American dream. We work to ensure that every immigrant in this nation has the opportunity to live with dignity and to live out their dreams, to live out the reason that they came to this country. And it has not been easy. Maria, you talk about starting up a nonprofit, that feeling of ihole every day. Every day, it is. Uh, it's a tough. It's a tough. Uh, a tough gig. But when I think about what it has been that allowed me to to to, to do this and to be with you all, I, I have to think about TFA and the, the opportunity to be in the classroom and to understand why it is that I'm passionate about this, why it is that this work is needed, and ultimately why it is that. Uh, it is my responsibility and our responsibility to be a part of the conversation. And I'll leave you, I'll leave you with, with one thing. That feeling of stepping into a room, of feeling the chilling AC, the carpeted floors, of seeing a bunch of people who don't look like me and who, quite frankly, I don't really understand why they act the way they do, is something I, I continue to feel every day when I step into a boardroom because 
so often I find that there's a lot of people who just don't look like me who are driving the conversation. And I have to say that because of my time as an educator and because of the work that I've done, this feeling of being foreign, of not belonging in that room, has been replaced by a sense of duty and a sense of responsibility and, under, and understanding that it is actually our duty as individuals who have privilege and who have access to opportunity and power to be at the table, to be a part of the conversation, and, and in fact, not just make sure that our perspective is heard, but that we shape the conversation. Because a quarter of Latinos, I mean, of students today are Latino. A growing number of voters are Latino. But think about how that's gonna change when a third of the population in 2060 is Latino. We need to be at every table. We need to make sure that we're talking about global warming, that we're talking about the economy, that we're talking about education and everything else. And the only way to do it is by recognizing that it is our duty to do that. So whatever sector you work in, whatever it is that you do today, being at the table and sharing your voice and sharing your experience is being an advocate for your students and is being an advocate for your community. So thank you for being here. Hola, bienvenidos. Uh, my name is Tony Vargas. Uh, I am the Director of Senior Leadership for the Policy and Advocacy Team uh, with Leadership for Educational Equity. I'm also a proud New York uh, 2007 core member, <laughs> alum, alum, I don't know if I said core member, because I'm amongst you all, I feel like I'm part of the core again. Um, uh, I'm also a very proud elected school board member representing uh, Nebraska, specifically South Omaha, one of the largest Latino serving uh, districts in the state of Nebraska. And I'm, I'm actually currently a candidate for the state senate in Nebraska to represent... <laughs> I will represent the largest Latino serving district in the state of Nebraska. That's what I'll do when I'm in the state Senate. Uh, uh, so, and, and you know, it's part of the reason why I'm here because I hear, I hear everybody and there, there's a continuum I see. I see different levels of engagement in like, what is the second part of our movement? It's very important that I acknowledge that because I want to do something right now. I want you to raise your hand if you are currently working in the education sector. All right, keep those hands raised. I want you to keep your hand raised if you currently work in a position that influences policy. Okay, okay. You can add, you can put your hand up again if you want. Keep your hand raised or add your hand if you work in a position that, advo that is in advocacy. Okay. Keep your hand raised or at it. If you work in a position that has influenced or either for getting out the vote or making sure people are getting into office. And now keep your hand raised if you are an elected official in some way influencing policy. Look around. This is a problem. You hear people constantly up here, the, the individuals before us and those at the table are saying we write our own narrative it's impossible for us to write our own narrative if we're not empowered at every single level of engagement. And right now, level of engagement is at the elected and policy level. If we don't have a seat at the table shaping policy in every single local municipality, state level, federal level, we don't have people viewing policy making through a lens of equity that is ensuring that our highest need communities and families and parents are getting what they deserve. And that impacts the bottom line, which is our kids. So my call to action is specifically around, make sure that you are, as, a, as an elected official in a state that I'm not from, but I identify with as a Latino first generation Peruvian, first generation citizen, oh yeah, Peruanos. Uh, <laughs> I identify with my community even though I might not be there. And in a short amount of time, I've been able to coalesce and work with my community and build bridges that have enabled me to be in a position to actually influence policy and be in elected leadership. And that's not what my major was, that's not what my parents did, that's not something that was handed to me. 
It was because, and I had to write it down, me tere, me tere en eso, porque I, you have to throw yourself into things that feel uncomfortable. So if you're wondering, why can't I get some culturally responsive uh, legislation out there that enables me to teach my kids their own history, we need people that are actually sitting in, in school boards. We need people that are sitting in city council. We need great staffers and policy staffers that are supporting those individuals to make sure that that is written correctly. So my call to action is you is, if you're not in a position that is influencing policy, advocacy, or elected leadership, why? If it's out of fear, not a good enough reason. Make sure you're informing yourself or bringing more people up so that we're getting more people at the seat at the table. Please, make sure we get a seat at the table. Thank you very much. Yeah, right. So, uh, you know, I uh, actually looked over when, um, when Veronica was speaking and I said to um, Sarita and Alejandra, I said, I think she should run for office. <laughs> and then to my surprise, then Tony Vargas is like, I'm running for office. <laughs> yeah, and that's what it looks like. Because, you know, this is the other thing I tell my students, because um, I always say to them, yeah, I know you guys think that there's a moment where it's all going to be cr crystal clear and you're going to understand everything. It doesn't happen. Okay, so even as you get older, the challenges just change. But the truth is, is that what we've seen from this panel is that when you're engaged in history, right, and looking at it straight on, then you're changing history. This is some crazy stuff. I'm so honored to be up here with all of you. Seriously, it makes me feel really optimistic. And by the way, um, I'm all about optimism in the year 2016 because we're going to flip the narrative. The glass is not half empty, it's half full, and we're going to make it that way. So let's, gonna, let's own that power. And also, um, I forgot to say something really important that um, I love the diversity of the Latino experience. And um, I am a Mexicana born in Mexico City, raised in Chicago. But I did marry a man from the Dominican Republic, so soy Dominicana también. <laughs> we're very complex. All right, we. Uh, <laughs> It's time for questions for our core members. So, go. Hi, my name is oh. Berlinda Mujica. Wait, where are you, where are you? Raise your hand. Oh, there you are, okay, yeah. good. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Maria, eres mi favorita. <laughs> Thank you, gracias. Um, I'm a Dominican, um, sec first generation Dominican um, from Boston. I'm a fourth grade teacher in Houston. I, um, as Latinos, we are culturally and linguistically diverse. And oftentimes I feel that Latinos are represented as exclusively Mexican or undocumented. So what can we do to shape our narrative to be more inclusive? Thank you, so wonderful. We're gonna do the same thing, just go back and forth and get questions and then they can answer. So on this side, yes. Hello, my name is El Cirueta and I am um, the founder of Tulsa Honor Academy. It's a charter school, college prep um, in East Tulsa, which is predominantly Hispanic. Um, very exciting. Um, when we're in our first year and we have no Latino teachers, not one single Latino applied, and this is, I mean, I, I did recruit Latino teachers, but it just, there were no applicants, and that's the reality, sadly, in Tulsa, Oklahoma right now. Um, but I look around the room and there are a lot of white allies in this room. Um, and so my question for all of you is, what can our white allies do to continue to support us in this movement? And then what can we as Latinos do to pull our white allies and utilize them in, in this movement so that one day there are more elected officials and so that one day I can have more brown teachers in my, in my school. White allies, black allies, Asian allies, Native American allies, all allies, LGBTQ Purple allies, allies, all the allies. Right, because that's what the futuro looks like. Thank you so much. Your question over here. Hi, um, I'm Daisy. I'm a bilingual teacher in San Francisco. Woo! <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, my question is about the bilingual models in schools. I am a bilingual teacher in San Francisco, Viva La Misión. Um, my school is a Title I school, and I'm starting to believe that certain bilingual programs are meant or created, by the way, not by Latino educators or people, <laughs> to segregate our Latino students and keep them in a cycle of failure, not leaving knowing enough English or enough Spanish. So my question is, um, what are you guys doing, or like, more like the White House doing, to stop this cycle of failure for our students. All right, thank you. We're gonna answer, so who wants to jump in and give a couple? We don't, not everybody has to speak. 
Just a couple of you answer, and then we're going to take some more questions so we can hear from the audience. I'm going to jump in on the bilingual models, um, since that's kind of the work that I'm doing at, in New Mexico. Um, what I would like to say is that sometimes we get caught up in the labels of this program or that program. I don't really care what it is. It's just got to work. And so I think that's the important thing that we need to be thinking about. And so when you are uh, building bilingual programs, um, it's really important to think about what the end goal is in mind and really work towards that and getting educators that support that vision and mission for the program. So whether you call it a dual language or a transitional or whatever, um, I've seen programs in our state work really well with all different labels. So not get, hung, get caught up in the labels, but really thinking about strong um, instruction because at the end of the day, as you all know, teachers and leaders are the most important school level factor and that's the stuff we have control over in the classroom. Thank you. Anybody else want to jump in on one of the answers to the questions? Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to respond to this uh, question about white, white allies, what can they do? Um, one, I, I don't think there's a recipe or a panacea for what white allies can do, because if that was the case, we would do it and everything would be fine, uh, or all allies. Uh, but I will say that uh, I do think there's a conversation piece to be had around how are we engaging in common conversation with all of our allies about the history of racial injustices that have occurred? Um, Sometimes it's hard to talk about the present without understanding where we came from and what has happened. Uh, I often view things through a lens of policy. So I look at what a policy and legislation has been passed since the 1400s to now that has influenced the injustices that currently exist in our system for people of color and for Latinos. I think engaging in that conversation with other allies in, in, in a very factual database way from multiple perspectives is one avenue to getting to a better place where white allies know what, what power dynamics actually are and how to break them down and, and acknowledge that in order to you know, open the pipeline for more people and to be an ally actually means sharing power with one another and giving up some power. That's a very important concept that I think is hard but a conversation absolutely has to happen. Pablo, you wanted to jump, or Veronica, did you want? Yes, also on the allies piece, I've often felt like, and maybe some of you in this room, that it's been a very black and white conversation, mm -hmm. and that Latinos, our native and AAPI brothers and sisters have often been left out. So how do we change that narrative and really work with our allies around that piece? In our work in Aurora, we have families from 130 countries speaking 120 different languages, and nobody's doing well. Our refugee brothers and sisters from Somalia, Burma, Nepal, our Latino, our African American families, nobody's faring well in our education system. So what, we, what can we do around the narrative ourselves and with our allies to be more inclusive? We're all on this boat together and nobody's doing well. So what can we do to elevate the voices of Latinos, but all of our families who are being, who are being horribly impacted by educational inequity and doing that amongst ourselves and with our allies? If I, you know, actually there's something about, and I love what you said, Veronica, learning, telling our students and our friends and family to learn to see ourselves and the people most unlike us. So as Veronica went through the communities in mm. Colorado now, um, it's the leadership role of the Latino community, like her family that's been there for seven generations, to now be working with Somali refugees. What does that look like, right? And the success stories when people are actually seeing themselves in the people most unlike them. Pablo, yeah. you wanted to jump in? I just want to, I'm an Ecuadorian that grew up in El Sereno, East LA, Mexican, so I want to go to the question of the diversity of Latinos. The truth is that I think part of the issue doesn't lie within a larger narrative in America, it lies within the Latino community itself where often we find division instead of common ground. And so having moved to the New York and mostly within Dominican community, you know, there was always a sense of like, oh, you speak like a Mexican, or this or that, we're trying to label each other. Instead of trying to speak from our own narrative, share that narrative and share that diversity. And when I represent Latinos, I talk about the diversity. And so it's incumbent on us to make sure that when we are sharing our narrative, we push that agenda, that this is a diverse community that represents different aspects, but we also share a lot. And in our shared struggle and our shared beliefs and our shared values, we also find a lot of strength. And so an asset-based approach to the diversity coming from Latinos themselves. Love it, okay. Can I, just one okay. quick yes. thing about uh, allies, going back to the question. Uh, I guess mine is, is, is a little bit more practical, but change takes energy, takes passion, takes dedication, takes time, but it also takes money. And one of the places where we need 
more diversity and we need more diverse voices and perspectives, is it those intersections with money and access to money? So as an ally, if you're someone who has access, think about how you can include these different perspectives and how you can empower those different things that you believe in and how you can ensure that you're not just making sure that the right people or what you believe are the right people are getting the resources, but that you're including folks at the table and you're bringing people to the conversation. Because that's, that's, I think, one of the most important ways to affect change. Okay, so recognizing basically that you do have access to people with resources, i.e. money, and bring them into the conversation because mm -hmm. nonprofits need people with money. And to, political candidates. And political candidates. Yeah. It's real. Okay, so now they're telling me I've only got five minutes, so what to do? Uh, we're going to take the last questions here, so just um, go ahead, rapid fire, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jose Miranda. I'm from Miami-Dade, and I'm an immigrant from Nicaragua. Uh, and my, uh, my immigrant experience taught me that civic engagement is crucial to have a seat in the table. So my question, I guess particularly for Tony, is for someone that doesn't know how to get there, how do you start? And maybe if you don't want to do an elected official, what else can you do to make sure you can influence policy? Okay, thank you. And on this side, your question? Thank you for letting me learn with you. My name is Shay. Um, over the past eight years, we've seen under our current administration more deportations than under any other president. Um, we are seeing families placed in detention when they're fleeing to the United States after significant persecution and violence. And I work with unaccompanied kids who every day must face a judge alone without a lawyer. Mm. The overwhelming message for our communities is a message of fear and an overwhelming sentiment that these families and children who are incredibly vulnerable are not welcome here. And my question to you, given your positions of leadership and power, is what you're doing to change the message and say you are welcome, we want you here, and you belong. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yes. Hi, my name is Naomi Fear. I'm a bilingual educator in San Francisco. Can you speak up into the mic, please? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Naomi Fair. I'm a bilingual educator in San Francisco. And my question is, I hear you when you say we need more Latinos at the table. Um, we need more Latino educators. But what are we doing to mobilize the Latino community? Because I find so often, wherever I go, that we're not united. We're very disparate. Um, and so what are we doing to really unite one another and, and elevate the community? Okay, thank you. Your question over here. Hi, my name is Ruben Vargas. I'm an eighth grade science teacher in Nashville. Um, I teach a lot of Latino kids, and my question is, I think that we talk a lot about inequity, educational inequity, but I don't think that we have to find what really educational inequity is for Latinos nowadays. So my question to you is, should we first uh, spend more time defining what ed educational inequity is? Also. How do we change cultural views about work and education so that our kids um, can see themselves actually being someone successful in the future and not immediately go back to that idea like, well, I don't need this. Like, I can go back and do the job that my dad is doing right now. Um, and my last question is, should our first step uh, be to define what the workforce for Latinos should be within the next 10, 5, 10, 15 years and where do we want our communities? to look like um, in those next 15 years, 20 years? Um, and where should we put an emphasis? Should we uh, improve in STEM careers? Or um, how are we going to get the Latinos to be the community we want them to be? So that's my question. And you said you were from Nashville? Um, I, I did the corp in Indianapolis in 2013, but now I'm teaching um, at, at a STEM school in Nashville. OK. Which, is, you know, the American South is actually experiencing the most intensive demographic growth in terms of diversity. Mm. So in terms of moving the conversation from black, white to multi-layered and complex, look to the American South because it's exploding. Yes, finally. Hi, um, my name is Angela Iadanza and I teach in Providence, Rhode Island. I teach uh, English as a second language. And um, when I learned Spanish um, during my core years and beyond, um, it radically improved my parent communication, my behavior management, and then also, obviously, like my students learning. So I guess what I'm wondering is um, what programs do we have in place in DC not only to get more um, like Latino and Latina native speakers in the classroom, but also to get more teachers um, educated in Spanish, in like Quiche, in like native languages to get 
um, students more able to learn and communicate with their teachers to kind of facilitate that like L1, like that first language like gap before they can really bridge into their second language. Right, and the whole issue of um, indigenous languages in our country so present. So I have to look at my boss. We can get, we have one minute. No, we have no minutes. We have zero minutes. We have zero minutes, which if you study math, means zero. <laughs> and if you check out and know about the Mayans, we can thank them for that zero. Um, <laughs> um, I'm really honored to have been in your presence today on this Saturday to leave here feeling incredibly optimistic with the core members, with your questions, with the leaders of excellence um, who are opening up the conversation policy-wise, to your own leaders within TFA. Um, this has been a beautiful, beautiful morning for me. I just want to say thank you to everybody, to Sarita, to Isela, to Alejandra, to Veronica, to Nicolás, to Tony, to Pablo, did I forget anybody? Pues muchas gracias. And thank you to all of you for, if this is what service looks like, it looks fabulous. Thank you so, 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 so much. Don't give up, we need you. Do not give up, we need you. Thank you so much. <laughs>